Yeah, welcome to our presentation on the numerical solution to Laplace's equation. I'm Jakob Hurt and I'm here today with my colleague Philip Müller. Hi. And um, I will start with some um, theoretic background regarding the Laplace equation. Okay. Um, yeah, the Laplace equation. The Laplace equation is um, this equation, the Laplace operator of a function is zero. Function in this case is a multidimensional function, so it maps multiple variables to uh, one real number. And the Laplace operator you can um, think of as the second derivative in multidimensional, yeah, in multiple dimensions. And the Laplace operator, which is this delta, is um, equivalent to the gradient, uh, the divergence of the gradient of f, and the gradient of f um, is can be thought of as the um, first order derivatives. And on the left side here, I have an example of a function f that satisfies the Laplace equation, which is x squared minus y squared. And um, this uh, creates the saddle function here. And um, yeah, as you can see, the Laplace operator of this function is simply the second um, order partial derivatives in every dimension. So in x dimension, added to the um, partial derivative in y dimension. Um, and um, yeah, as you probably know, the partial derivative of f in x dimension, um, the first derivative is simply 2x, and the second derivative is then only 2. And um, similarly for y, um, the der second derivative is also 2. So the result is just um, that the Laplace operator of this function f is 0, and that means this um, function really satisfies the Laplace equation. Okay. Um, and um, a little bit more on the Laplace operator. Um, so the, um, as I said, um, one part of the Laplace operator is the gradient of f, and uh, which is the first order derivative of s, f. And the gradient of f is plotted here in um, as this vector field. And um, the divergence of a vector field um, describes um, where um, the arrows of a vector field collect, so to say. I try to explain this easily. And um, as you can see in this vector field, there's no spot where a particle would accumulate if it flowed along the stream. And um, yeah, just at every point, there um, is somewhere out. And that is um, what, what it means if the divergence of the gradient is zero. OK, I try to give you a little bit more intuition what this means for the for the functions um, that satisfy this, um, firstly, you can imagine that there is no max or min, or else the divergence of the gradient uh, yeah, wouldn't be zero at this point. And um, another um, intuitive um, interpretation in two dimensions is that the curvature in one dimension exactly cancels out the curvature in the other dimension. If I go back um, two slides quickly, you can imagine that um, this curvature, or oh, I hope I can draw this kind of, um, exactly cancels out, out the curvature in the other dimension. And um, yeah, it's also called the, the Laplace equation is also called the equil equilibrium equation, because in many settings, um, um, this represents some kind of equilibrium. Um, for example, for um, heat flow, um, this is equivalent to the flow in x direction, and this is equivalent to the flow in y direction. And if they cancel each other out, that describes a stationary um, heat situation. Um, yeah, another way to look at this it is that influx must equal efflux at every point. Okay, so the Laplace equation, um, you can probably tell, has many applications. I won't go over them in detail, but just note that for example, gravity, the gravitational potential can be described as a Laplace, the solution to a Laplace equation, the stationary heat, heat equation. So when um, it doesn't change over time, satisfies the Laplace, Laplace equation. And in the electrostatic set, um, settings, the Laplace equation is satisfied as well. OK, um, a quick note on boundary conditions. The Laplace equation on itself has infinitely many solutions. And to get a unique solution, um, 
we need some form of boundary conditions and we focus here on Dirichlet boundary conditions, which are just fixed continuous values at some boundary. Okay, um, now um, in this case, we have a um, little bit more complicated boundary condition. We set the, um, the boundaries here in these squares to um, a specific value as well. And now the analytic solution, if um, becomes infeasible to compute, you just can't, uh, yeah, you just can't do this uh, feasibly. And that's why we want to um, design a numeric solver, um, which doesn't have any problems with very complicated boundary conditions. Okay, and that's uh, already our goal. We want to create a numeric solver. And of course, um, in this course, it should scale to large problem sizes on a cluster. Okay, our solution approach. Um, um, firstly, we consider the finite element method. That simply means that instead of considering the, the, the continuous solution, an infinite grid of infinitely small points, you consider a finite amount of grid cells. And that's what we do. We discretize our grid. And um, so, for example, for this center point, um, yeah, we, we index um, this function. And um, these are the, this is the neighbor above, to the left, to the right, and um, the neighbor below that cell, this is for a two-dimensional setting with a spacing half. So these grid cells, H, sorry. And um, these grid cells are um, H apart. And um, now these um, neighbor values can be approximated from the center value with the Taylor expansion of the second order. And um, um, if we add those together, you will um, soon see what uh, what's the result. This cancels, oh no, sorry. This part cancels each other out. So there's a plus and a minus. And um, that's why only this stays. And um, maybe you recognize this part. So this is um, one half of the Laplace equation. So if we add, um, so this is for the y dimension. And if we add, um, the approximation in the y and the x dimension together. This leads to this approximation that the Laplace operator uh, is this. And um, since the left side of this is zero, uh, we can reformulate this as um, this equation where the center point can be approximated by simply the average of its neighbors. And that's uh, really what I, uh, what's most important uh, for you to take away. I want you to take uh, this away from this. The um, center point can just be approximated as the average of its surrounding neighbors. Um, okay, so um, this um, gives us a way to decompose this Laplace equation into a system of linear equations, um, but um, for an n times n grid, this leads to n squared linear equations and solving the system directly is infeasible again. So we use a relaxation method which just means iteratively applying the approximation to every grid cell um, over and over until the result stops changing and um, Philip will explain in detail how we did this. And um, so there are two uh, variants of this, um, the Jacobi method and the Gauss-Seidel method. The Jacobi method acts out of place, so every grid, grid cell is effectively updated simultaneously from a previous values, which is pleasingly parallel. And there's a Gauss-Seidel method, which acts in place, so we write the new values back directly and um, this converges twice as fast because we use new values, but it's inherently sequential. Um, but it has the advantage that it allows over relaxation, which I will explain on the next slide. But both of these relaxation methods still have um, um, n to the fourth power runtime. Okay, now the idea of over relaxation is instead of taking the average in each dimension of the neighbor, neighbors, we um, overcorrect for changes um, by weighting this difference between the average from the neighbors um, to the current value with a weight, um, a relaxation factor, which must be in this interval. And we add that to the old value, and that's our next value. So we just, um, yeah, instead of just taking the average, we add a bit more on top. And um, this actually um, is. Um, simply a be better algorithm complexity-wise. But as I said, this depends on the gauss seidel method, which is um, not pleasingly parallel. Yeah, but, um, but it's um, still the approach we used. 
um, because yeah, to scale to large problems, it's really important to pick the right algorithm. And um, yeah, we find a way to parallelize this as my colleague Philip will explain now. Uh, wonderful, can I get the presenter? Mm -hmm. I think it's... Yeah. Yes, okay. Works. Um, yes, uh, our sequential solution. Uh, so I'm going to talk you through some of our functions. Um, first, it's not really a function, it's our data struct. Um, and we have a width and a height um, and of, of our field. And it's very um, important to know that um, we are using a vector to store our data and not a two-dimensional field. Um, so, of course, we need an index function to um, find out which place in the vector we have when um, using a certain x and y, um, just that you know. Uh, then our first function um, is our input function. Um, yeah, first of all, there's a heat here set. Um, in this example, it's 100. It could also be um, some other thing like electro electric potential or something, depending on the uh, scenario you're using. Um, we have the input width and the input height. Um, and also, we are initializing a field with NAND values. Uh, so we have a field of our width and of our height, and we are initializing it with NAND values. Um, it's important to say that for our purpose, we hard coded the input, um, but one could also imagine to take a, I don't know, a file or something and get the input data from that. Um, yeah, the second part of the get input function. Um, is um, this, and we have two uh, for loops um, iterating through the field. Um, and what this does is it sets our boundary condition. So um, when we would like to calculate a certain scenario, we need to um, tell the program, okay, um, I don't imagine you have like a square and um, the uh, upper border is hot, in this example, uh, if y is zero uh, equals zero, the upper border is, is hot, and every other border is zero. Um, while we're initializing the borders, um, I'm going to explain that later. But yes, for, for this scenario, for example, the upper border is hot, and the other one is heat, uh, like 100, and the other ones are zero. Uh, that's what the second part does, and this could also be taken from a file. Uh, in the future, not right now. Um, the next function, uh, get variable coordinates. Um, the function, I don't know if you remember, but I said the field is initialized with NANDs, and in the second part, in this part, um, some parts of the field are put to heat or zero. Um, the rest of the field, which is still initialized with NANDs, um, is being written back to variable coordinates down here. Um, that is important because the initialized values um, are static. So we are not going to iter iterate through them when we calculate the, um, the grid. Um, and in variable coordinates, we write every, um, every coordinates that are, that, that the program is allowed to change, to iterate over. Um, also, there's this little is border. Um, it just checks whether for a certain x, y coordinate, the value is on a border um, and throws an error if it is, because uh, the thing is, um, as Jakob explained, uh, we need the four neighboring values to calculate the value. Um, and a border only has three neighboring values, so that does not work. Um, and in our, in the, in the method we are using, the border needs to be initialized. The next for a function is rather small. We're making a first guess. Um, basically, 
every nan value is replaced with a zero so that the uh, function I'm going to uh, talk you through next can calculate with these uh, values because, well, it can't calculate with nans. Um, in our case, because it's quite simple, we chose not, uh, zero. Um, that might get important later. Um, the last function I'm going to talk you through is our biggest and more, also most important function. Uh, it's Zeitschritt. And uh, this function basically calculates the grid. Um, and you see there's some max iterations. Um, and we are going through the grid here. Um, and yeah, you might um, know that um, average variable. It's what Jacob explained. It's basically the average of the four points um, next to the point we're calculating. Um, we are storing our our old value because we also need that one for the calculation. And um, that function uh, you should also know from Jacob. Um, it's the function with the relaxation factor. And uh, right here um, is where the calculation is happening. Um, yes. In addition to that, we calculate our residual. Uh, the residual is basically um, that we are adding up each point's difference to the previous iteration on our residual value. And uh, you must imagine uh, the problem is we set max iterations to 10,000. And um, when the field is rather converged, so every value is the way he's supposed to be um, after, I don't know, 5,000 iterations, then 5,000 iterations are being done and nothing happens. And yeah, to uh, to not have that scenario, we calculate the residual. Um, so if nothing happens, the residual is zero. And if the residual is smaller than a certain precision we would like to reach, uh, we break from the loop. Um, yes. The problems with our sequential version is, um, or are, uh, we want higher accuracy because, as Jakob said, um, we are laying a grid over the whole thing. And the bigger the grid is, um, the uh, accu more accurate is our solution in the end. And a bigger grid needs, obviously, more performance because it's more points to calculate. Also, a bigger grid leads to more iterations to converge, which also needs more performance, which leads us to parallelization that we need. Um, our parallelization approach, um, there are two possibilities to parallelize the, uh, the program. First, you could split up the iterations. If you remember, we did 10,000. Uh, you could split that among certain threads, or you split the grid. Um, the problem is, iterations can, can't be split because every iteration depends on the previous one. So that would not make sense, which leads us to which leads us to the grid needing to be split. Um, that means that the boundaries have to be communicated. Um, yeah, which I'll talk you through later. How do we split the grid? Um, we figured out two um, useful possibilities to do it. First, we could split it in two dimensions, in n dimensions theoretically, but we are working in two dimensions uh, in our problem program, so split it in two dimensions, um, or we split it in one dimension. And uh, the thing is, we decided to split it in one dimension, even though in two dimensions we would have had uh, less grid for each um, thread to communicate. Um, but the thing is, in, if you split it in one dimension, it's way easier to um, set a certain amount of threads. Imagine trying to um, share this, uh, share with this method um, among like five threads or something where, how would you, would you part them? 
uh, whereas it is very easy to share this up on four or six or something as uh, the slides are just getting smaller or bigger. Um, yes, how do we divide the grid? So the thing is, um, not every, uh, we, we have a, um, as you see here, we divide the grid amongst uh, the, amongst the, uh, amongst X. And you could, um, we figured out that it's best to divide the grid amongst the longest um, dimension you have. Um, in this case, it does not matter. So we divide it by X. Um, and that leads us to the width that has to be um, parted into the, has to be parted to the different tasks. Um, we now have the problem that, for example, if we have a width of 10 and we would like to f use for threads, uh, that does not work. So we need threads that have a higher amount of tasks and we need threads that have, uh, no, we need threads that have a higher amount of, of, um, width and threads with a lower amount of width. And that's what happens here. Um, first we, um, look how big the smaller tasks are. So, for example, we divide 10 by, uh, what did I say? 10 and 4. We divide 10 by 4, um, and, um, that leads us to 2 point something. Um, so the smaller tasks are 2. Um, and then we look how many of them we have, uh, which also leads us to 2. And if your world rank is, uh, smaller than the smaller task amount, you get the lower local width. And if it's higher, you get the higher local width. So in our example with 10, we would have two tasks having a lower local width of two and two tasks having a higher local width of three, which leads us to three plus three plus two plus two uh, might be 10. Um, yes, then we have our function get input. Um, Get input ba basically is like the other function uh, we had before, but um, with the exception uh, that it um, uses the data from the grid division earlier um, and makes a, a local border for every thread. So the um, local borders for the thread um, happen here. And also the threads uh, get storage space for their data and their neighbor's data because you're, if you remember um, the um, borders had to be communicated. Uh, otherwise the function works as uh, the sequential get input function worked. Um, then we have to communicate the borders, which is kind of where our parallelization happens. Um, that is happening after every iteration and we're using send receive. So after the iteration is done, um, after every process is went through his part of the grid, um, everyone starts a send receive and um, actually starts two send receive calls, um, one for left and one for right neighbor and uh, sends data to his left and receives data from his left and sends data to his right and receives from his right. Um, and they send the most left and most right column of their uh, grid. And it is to note that um, we are just sending a certain space in the storage um, because we initialize the field so that the values are the values we are communicating, so from uh, x0 to x500, for example, um, so one, uh, one, yeah, uh, one, uh, no, uh, <laughs> they are uh, directly beneath it, each other in the storage, so they can be communicated easier. Um, yes. And after they send and receive their storage, they go on. Also, um, I've been talking you through the residual and why it's important to have one. 
um, we need to communicate the residual because if we didn't, the iteration would go for as long as the set iterations work um, and maybe do a lot of useless iterations. So we communicate our residual, which only happens every thousand, uh, hundred iterations. And that's a value we experienced by doing it. Um, yeah, we use all reduce. Um, everyone sends his residual to a certain node. Um, the node uh, looks for the maximum residual, sends them back. Um, so that if the maximum residual is smaller than, than the precision, every process terminates. Um, and if not, no process terminates. Okay, performance analysis. Um, first, we've uh, made our strong scaling test, and we made that with a 2,500 times 2,500 grid. Uh, we used 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128 threads uh, for the test to compare those. And it is important to note that only 100 and 28 threads are on more than one node. We made it on four nodes with 32 threads each. Yes, uh, here's our strong scaling graph. Um, yeah, in red there's uh, the ID, ideal speed up, like um, it, it doubles for each um, for each number of task increases. And in blue there's our uh, measured speed up, um, and uh, for example some value. Uh, the speed up for um, 128 is 99. Uh, that leads us to 0 0.778 of the efficiency that uh, um, that it had with one core, which is quite okay. Uh, yes, for weak scaling, I'm passing it back to Jakob. Thank you, Philip. Quickly taking the presenter. Okay, weak scaling uh, involves increasing the problem size while simultaneously increasing the task size. Again, we do this with this range of tasks. And um, we decided um, that it was best to fix the iteration count at 20,000 in this case, because as I've told you before, the, um, we have an algorithm that doesn't just depend on our grid size. Um, well, it only depends on the grid size, but not just linearly, but um, um, n to the third power. And that's why we fix the iterations at 20,000, because uh, it's much fairer and uh, gives us um, results that are easier to interpret. So, um, And what we scale up in the problem size is um, only the grid size, and we scale this up in both dimensions. So we use a square grid which is uh, 1,000 by 1,000 for one task and 2,000 by 2,000 for four tasks. So we um, yeah, we make sure that the, the total amount of grid points is proportional to the number of threads. Okay, and um, without further ado, here's the weak scaling graph. As you can see, it falls off relatively quickly. At um, one task, we have um, the, the regular speed up of one and at um, yeah, at 128 tasks, we only have less than 0 0.2, maybe less than 0 0.1 efficiency left, which is uh, pretty bad, to be honest. And um, yeah, especially at um, um, the, the, yeah, where the steepest descent is, um, we could have executed two times the, um, the, the test for um, 16 tasks in a series, uh, one after the other, and the, that would have been roughly as fast as the test with 32 threads. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, a possible reason for this, um, which we suspect, is that we chose suboptimal grid division. As um, Philip already explained, we divided column-wise. And um, if, if we had divided in a grid-wise fashion, then the per-task communication wouldn't rise. And in our case, um, because we divided column-wise, um, our per-task communication is proportional to n, which is the, the width of the grid. Okay, 
Uh, then we come to a little bit of uh, profiling and tracing with Vampir. And um, for this, we conducted a 32 task experiment, instrumented the program with score P and um, had a quick look at the profile. As you can see, um, we spend 20% of our time in NPI send receive currently, which is pretty bad. And um, yeah, we will find out later what the reason is. And um, this profile allows us to um, determine a tracing filter or um, estimate the size of the tracing. And we found out that uh, we don't need to uh, do any filtering because um, the trace will only be a few megabytes. So with that, um, let's look at the um, uh, the yeah the vampire graph of our um, um, of our program, and what you uh, see in green this is uh, pure calculation time in Zeitschritt, and all that you see in MPI um, uh, in red are MPI calls. For example, in the beginning you see clear border where every thread um, calls MPI init, and for some reason. Um, we have another partition where in the beginning there's for some reason a lot of communication happening and um, yeah then after that it looks pretty good the graph and um, initially we didn't know uh, what what this could be the um, our program doesn't have these two stages and um, yeah by zooming in we can also tell that thread 19 in this case takes um, much longer than all the others to calculate and that's the reason why, um, yeah, all of them have to are limited by thread 19, basically. And um, yeah, by looking at this pattern where the cake, um, yeah, basically where the slowness propagates th through the the threads along this line here, we made a lucky guess that it could have to do with denormalized floating point numbers. And we actually could confirm this. We performed a small benchmark. So this is. Um, the, the main loop code that um, Philip showed before, where we calculate an average. And um, we have one benchmark function where um, we calculate with regular floating point numbers. And um, we have one uh, other function that we benchmark where we use um, the denormalized, the smallest denormalized floating point number there is, which is something along the lines of 10 to the power of minus 50, which is an incredibly small number. And it, um, processes often um, specifically trap these numbers and um, take longer to calculate with them. And um, yeah, the benchmarks we uh, are that um, the normal floating point calculations take uh, 1.95 nanoseconds and the, um, when denormalized numbers are involved, it takes 50.9 seconds, which is uh, yeah, much, um, much slower. And um, with that, um, we, we found a simple fix. Let's just um, turn our initial guess into one instead of zero. Um, maybe you remember Philip explained the make initial guess function. We just replaced this zero there with one. And that took our, um, our calculation time from 28 seconds to 21 seconds. And um, yeah, in the profile, you can see as well that MPI sent receive and only occupies 3% of the calculation. MPI init now takes a significant amount of time. and um, yeah, Zeitschritt takes um, a reasonable 85% of the time. And you can also see the improved vampire profile where the stage where the denormalized floating point numbers propagate uh, until they're eliminated just doesn't exist. And um, yeah, the result is a much faster calculation in this case. Yeah, um, let's come to the conclusion quickly. Um, did we achieve our goals? I do think so. We um, implemented a numeric solver and it scales, uh, at least the strong scaling is pretty good. We can, of course, there are lots of performance improvements, especially re with regards to the weak scaling. Keep in mind that um, the weak scaling we performed um, with the denormalized flowing point numbers, maybe that um, has to do something with that. And um, um, another improvement might be to make it n-dimensional because the Laplace equation doesn't only apply to two dimensions, but to any amount of dimensions, which in the three dimensions, it's also practically relevant. And um, we want to support arbitrary input files in the future, because currently, yeah, in, as Philip mentioned in get input, um, yeah, we have uh, hard coded um, uh, boundary conditions. Okay, and um, a small meme uh, at, the, at the end, 
So to the left, you see an, an analytic solution that we calculated with the analytic solution to the Laplace equation with specific boundary conditions. And to the right, you see a numeric, uh, numeric solution that, um, uh, that we calculated with our program. And as you can see, they look um, very similar. And we actually tested this, that our um, solver can produce um, results that align with um, the analytic solutions. And um, yeah, with that, I finish our presentation and I would love it if you have any questions for us.